They're here. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Oh I God. just want to I just want to take a moment to uh, get us started off here. For those of you who are joining us and have never been at the theater at a theater roundtable previously, um, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Matthew Wright. I'm a professor of theater here at Oberlin College, and um, it is my great, great privilege to welcome our beloved guest, Ms. Deanna Reasonover, um, to our theater roundtable discussion today. The theater roundtable was something was an initiative that we started this year in order to uh, connect all of our theater community, both our current students as well as our faculty, staff, and alumni. And uh, we have had a resounding success with it. We've had a number of panels about all kinds of issues facing theater today, um, most especially uh, the impact of the Black Lives Matter movement on the theater, as well as um, COVID and its uh, obvious effects on the way that we have gone about doing business for the past year or so. And uh, speaking of COVID, I just want to let everybody know that that I am in, that I am in the throes of uh, COVID vaccine fever myself at the moment. So um, uh, I have asked my beloved colleague and the department chair of theater, Ms. Caroline Jackson Smith, to join us today to um, to help conduct this discussion in case I pass out here by my computer screen. That won't happen, I promise. But anyway, um, we're so happy to have you here, Deanna. It's so beautiful to see you. And uh, I am going to pass it over to Miss Caroline. Hi, Deanna Reasonover. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so I don't have your bio in front of me to read, so I would rather structure this around your talking us through the different parts of your career, okay. starting from what you remembered Oberlin. I remember seeing you in the play Matt Wright directed, which was awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I want to just say to everyone that the first time you guessed it on NCIS, I was like, that is her. She's the perfect person for that part. They better keep her. <laughs> you are <laughs> You were I so mean, kind. seriously, I was like, how perfect. Um, just knowing you and all your personal and artistic qualities, I thought they were lucky to find you. So um, so <laughs> can you talk a little, yes. Can you talk a little bit about your time here? What were some things you did that were important to you that helped you decide how to move on to the next stage? Well, um, I also want to say Matt directed me uh, in a, a very like, a great play that I still love. Caroline yeah. was my first director. <laughs> she directed me. And Chris Flaherty gave me my first job at Oberlin in a costume shop, working a uh, costume for the opera. And wow, it was the first time I'd ever been in a shop. I still sew. I sew this. Okay. I sew this jumper right here. Okay. Gets me auditions, this jumper. Thank you, Chris. Saving me money, okay? You gotta go to oh, Forever 21. And I'm thank Forever you 21. for that shout out. <laughs> okay, um, but okay, so to the question, I did wanna give a shout out to everybody because I, I love you. it so much. Um, I, I learned so much from my time at Oberlin. Um, I actually, in those plays, you know, in the one that I did with Caroline, uh, that was a play where I was doing something that I had never done before, which was I was dancing uh, because it was a musical. And that taught me right then and there, you have to be ready for everything. It's mm. not just what you think you're necessarily like comfortable or good at, because if somebody casts you in something and they say, I can see you doing this, you better find that confidence to do it um, yourself, even if you don't necessarily believe you have it. Uh, I also really learned, you know, professionalism. You guys know that uh, your grade depends on you showing up to class, showing up to rehearsal. Uh, your paycheck depends on you showing up to work. <laughs> showing up to auditions, being off book when they ask you to be off book. And it sounds like a small thing, but I can't tell you how many times I've showed up to a table read and it's very obvious that the person that's reading the script in front of the network has never read the script. Wow. Has no idea what's going on. It doesn't wow. seem like it affects things, but the writers are the producers. And if you're not making them look good, they'll replace you. So I've learned, I learned 
uh, at Oberlin, I really learned to open myself up to doing other things. After Oberlin, I went to grad school. I went to Cal Arts for grad school because I felt like I wanted a little more training. Um, and that's where I started to do a little more on camera work. I had taken one class, I think at Oberlin, um, Matt Wright had structured a really great guest professor, Isabel Gillies. Oh, Isabel from Law and yep. Order. From Law and Order. She and just came back and died. She came back for one, one <laughs> five minutes on the new Law and Order organized crime where they brought Elliot Stapler back. She literally came on and then they killed her off. They do that all the time. I mean, at least she gets some residuals from that. But I, truly, I don't know why. But look where I ended up. I still ended up on a procedural. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, and yeah, it was really my love of theater that got me on camera because uh, I had, like I said, developed a real love of theater when I was at Oberlin. Uh, and the first show I did out here, I won't go through them all, but was Romeo and Juliet. And I was, you know, Juliet dies. You know, she's, she's sitting up there dead for a couple scenes. And I was like, I remember, at the end of act three, like when they have that marriage being like, I wish we could end the show right here. Just be like, and scene. And laying up there dead <laughs> and being like, I gotta just find a job where I'm not dead. Um, <laughs> and it was there I knew, I was like, I might have to move on to TV because I, I did spend quite a bit of time just pretending to be dead in several plays on stage. And I was like, I, I need to do something else. I need to live to see the end of the play. So not horror yeah. movies. Can I just ask you, what was it like, or how would, was your decision form to go directly to grad student school? Because a lot of our students ask us the pros and cons of working for a while, going straight in. And so how was that experience for you? Well, oh gosh. All right, I'm going to ask a show of hands. Do you guys want the real answer or do you want the like very nice, like the real answer, okay. I didn't have any skills that I felt would translate to a real job. I was like, I have these student loans. That's real. I, I just need to defer them for another <laughs> three years until I know what I'm doing, um, which ended up not being the greatest idea because then you end up with more uh, school loans. Uh, but Matt, actually, I talked to him about it. He had gone to San Diego, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I remember he said that that was a really great thing for him. And I was like, I'm gonna try grad school. If you do go to grad school, go somewhere where you get a nice scholarship because mm -hmm. it really is, it's no joke, those student mm -hmm. loans, as mm -hmm. I'm sure people know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was the right choice for me because I needed to do a little bit more growing up. Mm -hmm. I needed to get a little bit more confident in myself. And I got to do that during grad school. Mm -hmm. But but there are so many people that don't go to grad school. You have a great base education. And even if you whether or not you go to grad school, just know that you're going to have to do some studying if you want to pursue acting, no matter where you go. You're going to have to do some commercial classes or scene study, something in the city to kind of catch up to what the people that are casting are looking for. That makes a lot of sense. So is it, do I remember this correctly, that in the beginning of your career, you were doing a lot of things online yourself, um, like using your comedic talents and other things. <laughs> I think it's it's a good it's a good way yeah you know if you can't get work make it for yourself you know what I That's mean it. don't be afraid mm -hmm. to put yourself online some writing it's a good way to practice mm -hmm. um, because when people ask you for a reel you probably won't have one <laughs> so you know having a couple scenes that you've written that feature you and feature the kind of things that you want to do that makes sense for you to be doing mm -hmm. um, is, a, is a good way to make work for yourself. Mm -hmm. So when she decided to go on camera and stop dying on stage, what were some of the steps you went through to be able to start getting more work and the kinds of things that you enjoyed? Hopefully. It, yeah, I do. No, I love it. I love it. It's, um, I, I think the industry has really undergone a significant change in the last few years, and hopefully it continues to change for the better. But um, some of the stuff that we used to do, you don't have to do anymore. So I'll just let you know, printing out 200 headshots and mailing out mm -hmm. uh, mailing out those postages, probably don't have to do that anymore. That costs a lot of money, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Casting director workshops, no shade, but they were a lot of money. Mm. Um, that was where casting directors would be like, come and do a workshop with me and maybe I'll call you in. Oh. $75 you'll never see again. You don't mm -hmm. have to do that anymore. Um, it's really about having 
you know, what, what, however, it's really about getting up to date with however the people that are casting are casting. So in LA, you know, there's um, online databases where you kind of like upload your reel and your resume and getting on those and making sure that you have, you know, headshots, et cetera, et cetera. Taking those classes, like I said, actual classes on camera classes, not just workshops where people are promising you an audition maybe. Um, that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Okay. Do you, so what was kind of your first gig on TV or film that you felt substantial? I was on Basketball Wives. Uh, oh, I didn't even know that. I was on Basketball Wives. With, what did with, you do uh, on Basketball Wives? I rapped. It was a bad rap. I'm not good at it. Yeah, nobody's going to put me in Hamilton. So, but it was what the moment called for. Okay, so okay. Uh, I think my first thing that I ever really did, I'm struggling on order. I had a guest star on Two Broke Girls, mm -hmm. I think, or I, I can't remember if I booked this. I may have booked a pilot before I booked Two Broke Girls, but I booked something. And once you have that one thing on your reel, it's a lot easier, you know, on your mm -hmm. resume, it's a lot easier to get others. Mm -hmm. So when you say you're real, talk to everybody about that. So every time you perform something, do you add a clip from that to your reel or how, how do you manage that? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, so my reel is um, it's just a series of clips. It's not the whole show. It's not every line that you had, but just little bits that highlight. It's less than five minutes. I mean, five minutes is really stretching it. Yeah. Um, two, three minutes is a good sweet mark. If you don't have anything to put on your reel, if you just have like one scene, that's fine too. Curated is better than longer. Mm. Um, mm. And it's nice to just have like little clips of the show. Let's see if I have my reel on Ooh, my computer. Let's see it, yay. I, sh I definitely should have it on my computer. <laughs> Whether or not I do is a whole nother thing. But keep keep asking yeah. while I- Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so that's that's really helpful because one of the things we're realizing here is how much auditioning just happens virtually now that there much, there seem to be a lot fewer live auditions at least until you get closer to a project is has that been your experience? Yes, yeah. Um, it's it's all it's all virtual right now. Oh gosh, here it is. Wow, how embarrassing. My do we have to share? Maybe um, share screen. Um, Julian, I can. Yeah, Julian, can you give a uh, screen share to Diana? See if you see it coming up as co-host. Um, is so, that helpful? Do you all want to see what like a real yes, look looks yes. like? Okay. Yes. We won't we won't show the whole thing and we'll skip around just so you this is not to promote myself, but just so you know like kind of what it looks like. Yes. Because I, I think one thing that does happen is you kind of get out to whatever big city uh, and there's all these terms like sides mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. what that kind of all, mm -hmm. all that stuff kind of means. So can oh I can share a screen okay oh nope okay it, we're working on that we're working on it okay Julian are you working on it just let me know give me a heads up yes no I see you're muted <laughs> I'm hoping Julian's working on it since he's kind of the manager of this whole experience you know what I can sorry what what was that Caroline oh trying to screen give uh Deanna sh uh, screen share oh yeah we just have to make her host oh, sorry oh, so yeah. I was just gonna let you do it. So since me trying to do more than one thing at a time is <laughs> a good thing. <laughs> That's why I have my younger colleagues and many students who know much more than me. It's quite a blessing. <laughs> okay. Did you get it? Okay. Yes. Oh, cool. So, so CIA is your agency, yeah? Yes. So I'm with CIA. So it's nice to just kind of have like at the top your name, et cetera. I think is this, does it have sound when I share it? Will it have sound? We'll see. We'll press play and we'll see what happens. You might have to press the share sound function too. Can you hear it? No. No, we can't hear it. Okay. I think um, there's a share sound <laughs> somewhere. Somebody help. Cyril, Alex, anybody who's good at this, where yeah. is her? If you unshare and then hit share uh, again, you'll see it. There's like a box at the bottom that you can click and it says share, share computer sound. Oh, there it is. Great. I've done so many Zoom meetings and I just never actually have to do all this. Right, exactly. Um, <laughs> we'll skip to the first scene anyway, so that's fine. So, you know, always the show, the network. Oh, just the two of you? 
Or should I come back in a minute when you're a party of 12? <laughs> Do you know of an animal testing plant that's supposed to be here? It's gone. It's Chili's now. Welcome to Chili's. Diane, he finally did it. He proposed. <gasps> oh, look at that. Well, it's about damn time if you want my two cents. Diane. I know I shouldn't cuss, but that man has been holding a torch for you for way too long not to be acting on it. He's asked us to move in with him. Mm-hmm. We've been outgrowing this house. He asked me and Elias to move in with him. You're like the Beatles, you know? The Beatles? Yeah, the best at this, doing what I want to be doing and meeting you, I guess I'm just a fan. <laughs> fan. Right. So you guys get it. Uh, but but you get you get that. So it's like it's just like little a reel is like little clips of things you've done. And not to be weird, if you have a scene with like someone a celebrity yeah like yeah. that people are going to recognize you kind of uh -huh. want that at the front even if it's a shorter thing mm -hmm. um and if you don't let's say you're starting off and you don't have a reel you're like i don't have any of these scenes great thing to do make something with your friends mm -hmm. and try to really study what it is you want to do for example i have a period piece at the at the top there's not a lot of those but it was a good at that time one of mm -hmm. the few dramatic showcases that i had so that's why i kind of went at the top Study what you want to do and then try to make something that looks similar to that. Mm -hmm. um, because the one thing that people do is they sometimes put like a monologue out, out there as their reel, which sometimes looks weird for casting directors, just so you mm -hmm. know, because it, it's not how TV is ever really, or movies don't really have a whole lot of just static monologues. So try to make uh, something right. similar. That is great advice. I know that Matt right now for the first time is teaching a senior acting capstone, trying to pay more attention to both professional preparedness as well as training and creating work. So these are important things for us to know. I did notice the period and I, I what I noticed there is something that I hope all our young aspiring actors will do, which is to show yourself in a variety of types of roles that you can do a variety of things. So it was nice to see that period piece and that you had that wig on. <laughs> I like that to do a, like a lot of parts with your natural hair. So that, that I love your natural hair on NCIS. That wig and me had a fight that morning. Let me tell you, anytime you have to wear a wig, just playing on an extra 40 minutes in the chair. Get there early, get your breakfast on the way. Just know those wigs, they will fight you. <laughs> Well, you know, speaking of that, how has it been for you to use your natural hair in a lot of parts? Like in this current part, did they book you that way? And people have wanted it to stay that way, although I've seen some cute adjustments here over time, but pretty much you're still in your natural hair. Pretty much, pretty much. Um, yeah, people love it, which is great for me. Uh, but also I will say, um, man, it's so hard to say this. Uh, that people don't always know how to deal with it. Like nope. they love the way it looks, but that doesn't mean that they know how to yep. style it right? Um, or how to protect it from getting damaged. Doesn't mean that they, they're like, oh, we celebrate darker or all skin tones. Doesn't mean that they necessarily have the correct foundation for you. So just, you know, be prepared. I'm not great at doing hair and makeup, but I always, when I go on set, uh, and I'm not the only person that's done this. Um, always have a little bag that I bring with mm -hmm. me of just stuff that I need of like, mm -hmm. you know, my hair gel, my little edge control, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, just in case they don't have it. And it's Foundation, very- Foundation, color. <laughs> yeah, it's very dumb that I do that, but you know, no. I've definitely gone back in the trailer like, okay, thank you, yeah. you know, <laughs> as I leave. I hear this um, all the time though. I've, it sounds like a great tip. Well, because it yeah. goes along with be prepared but it's mm -hmm. very specific which makes me wonder in the time that you've been um doing television and film have you seen a difference in the opportunities for black actors or yes. the way roles are being crafted yes absolutely and i've seen more people starting to embrace i've had my friends that i've had this conversation with they call me and they're like i went on set and they had somebody to do my hair and they really did it like they really did it and i'm like yay they did it so there there are definitely more opportunities there are but you know there's still a ways to go so um i'm, I'm always one of those protect yourself first kind of people like just you know be prepared and it's dumb but yeah yep this way it is well, I want to go back for a minute to um, how you got your agent. By the way, what was the 
and underneath CAA, it said Principato something. What what did that mean? Oh yeah. So that's my old reel. That's my man. That was my manager oh. at the time. Mm -hmm. um, was Principato Young. Now they are artist first. But just uh, basically any kind of title card with uh, a with a protected version of your information on there. Mm -hmm. So I personally always recommend, especially for young actors. Um, get a Google voice number, get a, a email address that's not necessarily connected to your personal email address ah. um, so that you can give out your information because you're not always going to be dealing with people that are forthright. You want some kind of protection for yourself. Mm, that is very good advice. So I noticed that you're in C with CAA now, which is um, one of the top two agencies. As far as I know, I don't know, maybe they're the top one. They all keep, you know, absorbing other people. <laughs> But how, talk about the journey of getting an agent. Did that start with graduate school or something that you had to do on your own? Oh, grad school. So, you know, I did the showcase. Um, a lot of grad schools and colleges have a showcase and they invite all the agents and they they come and they watch and they contact people. And that's a great way to get an agent. I got zero <laughs> interest when i say i got negative interest from my showcase i am not kidding uh, um heard that story before <laughs> yep nothing uh and i ended up with i ended up finding um my first agent through a friend a friend had booked a microsoft commercial and he was real chill uh he was like come over to my agency they'll love you and oh. i did uh, and I did, and he gave, I gave them my headshot and my resume, and they got me, um, I'm not kidding, they got me exactly one audition for a voiceover in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. I did not go, as I was like, I don't speak a lick of Spanish. Um, and then they dropped me. <laughs> they were like, well, we don't know what to do with you. And I was like, that's fair. I never lied and said I knew Spanish. Um, so sometimes you end up with people that just don't know how to market you, and that's that's what it is. You want someone who's a good fit. I'm here to tell you, you'd rather have someone smaller who's a good fit yeah. than someone larger who doesn't mm -hmm. know what to do with you. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I just wandered about agent lists until I saw on one of those websites that I told you about where you host your reel and your resume. Um, somebody was accepting submissions. I submitted and I got my first agent. Wow. Um, and then I got CAA because I had an audition for a show. I think the show was called Brothers in Atlanta. It was on HBO. It was DeSeuss and Mero. Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was, yeah, it was their show. I had an audition, didn't get oh. the part. But one of the executives who was auditioning me later became, became an agent for CAA. Oh. And so she followed me secret, my career secretly for years. And once oh. I started booking, she reached out and was like, hey, if you're interested in CAA, we're interested in you. And so you never yes, know. Yes, I am interested in something. Yeah, you never know where an agent will come. Always be nice. Always be professional. Always be nice. mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's funny. You know who always says that when he visits is John Kander, one of our alums who oh, yeah. ha has given money so that our smaller theater is named after him um, after its <laughs> renovation. But, you know, he's been in the business for a very long time. And <laughs> anybody who doesn't know, he's you know, written Cabaret Chicago, etc. Mm -hmm. And he's the nicest person you ever want to meet. And he says the same thing. If you can do one thing, be nice to everyone, be good to work with. So people yes. will want to call you back. So yes. Yeah. yeah. It's so it's it's so important. And wait, tell me the name of the what's the name of the small theater? It um, was Little Theater. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But now it's the Candor Theater because of John Candor. So, and by oh, the way, Deanna, when you're able to come here live, which we hope you will, you have to go see the brand new costume shop where Chris is in our brand new theater because we now have an entirely new building that is a medium-sized theater we've never had before. So in one fell swoop, we got the Candor money to redo the little theater. And at the same time, through the generosity of only three or four main donors, we built a whole entirely new theater with a, also has a rehearsal room with it and it has a brand new costume shop as part of it. So you'll love that when you come here. And then we've still got our, our famous hall auditorium 
where mostly the operas are being done right now. So we can't wait to have you here live at some point. I can't wait. I love that. Yeah, well, speaking of that, just talk, well, I wanted to go back to Two Broke Girls and then some more things happened until NCIS. So when we get to NCIS, I want to talk about shooting schedules and how that goes, because it was really funny, you know, trying to figure out your schedule. And I, I knew that would happen. I mean, yeah, especially now, I'm sure. But tell us before that, just say a little bit about that journey after Two Broke Girls and, you know, the couple of other things you booked on the way to continuing to get different kinds of work. Oh, sure. Um, I, I started off most of my work in multicam, which is very close to theater. First off, does everyone know the difference between single cam and multicam? No. I do not. I would like cool. to. Say. Oh, great. Okay, I'll explain it. So, um, Multicam is uh, the easiest way to think of it is stuff that's filmed in front of a live studio audience. Oh, so multicam literally means multiple cameras are running at the same time. It usually does. It's the stuff that you think of that has a laugh track. So mm-hmm. like Friends, Seinfeld, Two Broke Girls, mm-hmm. all multicams. Mm-hmm. Single cams are um, they usually shoot with just one camera at the same time. It doesn't seem like it's that big of a distinction, but it literally is. Um, if you think of stuff like most drama um, that's obviously shot with a single cam, but it's not called a single cam, but um, oh gosh, what is that show I'm thinking of with Ty Burrell, Modern Family, oh, uh-huh. um, Parks and Rec, uh, 30 Rock, all single cams. So what, the diff- so what the big difference between those two things are is that single cams are basically closer to shooting a movie where you're kind of stopping and starting and adjusting and everything is all done on on that day so Mm -hmm. you might know that you're shooting like the first scene and you're rehearsing it that day you're shooting it that day multi-cams are more like a play where for a week beforehand you are rehearsing the whole thing and then in one night you do the taping usually in front of a live studio audience Mm -hmm. So you said you did those in the beginning of your career and Mm -hmm. what was that experience like? I loved it. (laughs) I love it. I love people laughing at me as soon as I say a joke. It feels very (laughs) good. Um, It it feels great. You know, it it feels closer to my roots, my theater roots. Um, It also, it's what I grew up watching. I grew up watching multicams. So it felt like I had gone into my childhood TV. I love it. Yeah. Um, single cams to me are harder because uh, you don't have that immediate feedback. And so you really are depending on your skills and your tastes. I mean, obviously the director will tell you, but sometimes sometimes directors don't direct as much as you think they're going to. That was going to be one of my questions in yep. TV, how much actual direction, the way we think about directing actors as opposed to directing traffic and hitting your marks and things like, I mean, it would seem like the composition is really important in TV directing, but do like in the development of your character in NCIS, how much talking have you done with writers, showrunners, producers, directors? How, how, how does that process happen? I don't tend to get super involved in um, character decisions. I'm very much like, <laughs> there is somebody that, get pay- that gets paid a lot more than me to make those decisions. You can go ahead and you can get your paycheck and I'll get mine. You let me know when to be here. Thank you. Um, but if there's something I do have a problem with, I will say, you know, I will speak up. Um, and there have been a couple of things where I'm like, hey, what's going on here? Um, can you give an but, example of that? Yeah, like, um, little things so you know it's a procedural obviously um okay so yeah I'll give it I'll give a very specific example so the writers of NCIS are actually very open um way more than I thought they'd be and they always say like is there anything you're interested in well I've always been very um conflicted in a way about being on a show that is a police procedural given the over incarceration that's happening with people of color um you know, the way that we are treated by the police, by the media, and not really wanting to glorify that. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I would like to do an episode that reflects over incarceration and it reflects the idea, you know, that we have to stop looking at people like they're guilty. Mm -hmm. Um, And that a lot of times when you watch these shows, everybody looks like a suspect, everybody looks like a criminal. And it's Mm -hmm. really driving the way that our society thinks about people of color. Mm -hmm. Um, So we did do, you know, 
I I love that episode. I'm glad you said you asked for it because it really stood out. I don't know if I tell anybody else what happened in that episode, but it was really singular. (laughs) Not to mention the fact that you got to drive it, which was very cool. It was really fun. And the writer really did a great job. You know, he, that was all I gave him. I didn't, you know, give him books or articles or anything, but you know, it's still, and I'm not saying that that episode fixed America. It absolutely didn't, but (laughs) I didn't, I did feel like at some point, you know, it needs to be addressed. Yeah. Um, And I'm not patting myself on the back about that, but that is an example of how I, you know, kind of talked to them Mm -hmm. and they made some adjustments, made some changes for me. Uh, As far as when you're on set, you, it's really going to be good to remember what everybody's role is because most directors, when they're coming in to direct, they are not the lowest person on the totem pole, but TV directors get overridden by producers all the time. time. So they're really trying to make sure that they still have a job at the end Mm -hmm. of the week. Mm -hmm. Plus they're having to deal with the DP, plus the lighting, plus the, you know, the sound guy has a huge problem with this blocking, da, 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 plus this network note. So they don't really have time to be worrying about you. So it's very important that you do your homework, that you know kind of what your objective and a scene is, kind Mm -hmm. of your overarching arc where you are in the script that's mm-hmm. all stuff that you're kind of doing and they're just kind of shaping lightly mm-hmm. so what i'm hearing you say is that when you say the character is your is, you know you've been given it that says to me that the writing really is good enough that you know who that character is you know the generally the producers and the writers have decided something about that character that you can connect with and work from you- Yes, but also the way I approach everything, comedy is my strength. That's what I'm really good at. So I go to every every script, no matter what it is, and I look at it. And the first thing I do is I say, how can I make this as funny as possible? And sometimes (laughs) it's good that I've done that. And sometimes it's not. (laughs) But that is, there is a space for that because look who you came after. I mean, that's why the first time I saw you in the show, I thought how perfect because of your sense of humor Wow. that I knew was going to built into that character because of the way they had construed, you know, that element of that show. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then you get all the technical language. What about all <laughs> police procedural? Yeah, what about you're in the lab? What about mastering all this technical information? That, you know, YouTube, you know, you can print <laughs> YouTube. Uh, you guys have an Oxford English dictionary. Log in through the school. Use it to look up anything you need. But I will say, um, oh, this is actually great. Have you guys had Matt, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Paul Moser's uh, Shakespeare class? Does Paul still teach Shakespeare? Some, I, the, some of the students who are current students here have. There's okay. D-way, that's D-Way. D-Way is raising their hand. I okay, don't know, cool. Cyril. So I don't think they had that class, but many people have. I scan my scenes like it's Shakespeare. Like oh. I figure out where to put the stress. Oh. on the sentence because sometimes them sentences just don't make any sense oh hey you just left that <laughs> class okay <laughs> sometimes the sentences don't make any sense and I have no idea what they're saying I'm trying but it's so technical um because that's my job is to give something that makes the audience go what yes um uh so sometimes can I show you all a script is that yes, too yes we everywhere? would love to is that too okay <laughs> what do I say I just left that class <laughs> It's very, very, very helpful to know. Oh gosh, I had, oh, here it is. Okay, so I brought with me, I thought it might be helpful to kind of show you all what um, what sides can look like. Sides oh, are this, sides are literally the part of the script mm-hmm. um, that you're auditioning with. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was my NCIS audition side. Oh my goodness, um, okay. One, one, when you see it, one, I'm just gonna scan through everything really quick. Um, you're going to see first first off it's a, often a lot of pages so that's number one you won't have a ton of time things are going to be crossed out or written like just as fyi they'll tell you where to end but the first thing you want to do is when you look at us when you look at the scene try not to just read just your lines really take some time and read like all the way other people's lines stage directions stuff mm-hmm. if they give you anything else that says just like info make sure that you read that as well and try to get a sense of, you know, the, and then at that point, start doing the same things that you would do normally for a script, you know, start to get a sense of who your character is. Um, but don't worry about props. Everybody's always worried about props, all that kind of stuff for Zoom auditions. Just make sure you have good lighting and you can be seen. Mm-hmm. 
that's Good lighting. Mm -hmm. That's more important. If you can invest in a, it doesn't have to be a ring light. It can just be some good sunlight. But um, I just wanted to show you all what sides look like. Not as though you've never seen scripts before, but sometimes it's it's helpful to see. So did you actually read with um, Gibbs blanking on Mark, Mark Harmon? Did you actually read with him or? No, I when I auditioned for NCIS, reader? no, I think I, I read with the the casting director. Oh. When I auditioned for NCIS, I had actually just had uh, open knee surgery. Oh. And so I was in uh, a knee immobilizer and crutches. I could not walk. I skipped my first audition because it was two days after the surgery and I was still like on painkillers. And I was like, I can't do that. Um, assumed that I had lost the role and they were still auditioning in January. And oh. every time I went in, I shed some accoutrement. So the second time I went in, I had one crutch. The third time I went in, I had no crutches and uh, and like just my knee immobilizer. So I just kept getting a little better. So wait, these, so these were physical auditions you were going in for? Yeah, these were physical auditions I was going in. Yeah, I was. I assumed that I did not get the job because I go like, okay, thank you, as I left the room, and then very slowly have to bend over and pick up my crutches and my bag and crutch out the room. And nobody talks while you're leaving is the other thing because nobody wants to talk about you while you're there. So it's just like seven people staring at you as you try to leave as quickly as possible. How, well, how did you come, how did you come to that audition for you know a show that? has been on for 20 years and is one of the, you know, in a franchise and all of this. And isn't Mark Harmon the producer also, or one of the producers? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep, he's one of the EPs. One of the, um, one, I have to thank um, one of the uh, casting directors for, uh, for CBS um, knew me and uh, he had submitted, he submitted me for the role and they had seen so many people that I assumed they weren't gonna see me. I guess I can stop sharing this. Um, but it was great. It was wonderful. They were. I was very lucky, very fortunate uh, that they were able to see me. That's how I got that audition. So I heard something really important in that story also, which is you might get called back a lot of times. You might not know you got it, but you just mm -hmm. keep being as prepared as you can and mm -hmm. just showing up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and make it, and, and not being afraid to make a choice. I mean, nothing too out of the ordinary, but I think when I first got when I first started auditioning, I was really, I was really worried about being technically perfect, like making sure I just fulfilled this role. But you know, they want you, they want to see you. And that goes back to the hair, that goes back to the makeup. Mm -hmm. If you're not a, if you're not like a super glam person, don't feel like you have to show up, you know, mm -hmm. full face beat. If mm -hmm. you are a super glam person and this seems to be a smaller role, don't feel like you have to shrink yourself just be you and uh, eventually they'd rather see your personality than they would see what they technically want on the page. Well, I'm going to ask you maybe two more questions and see if anybody else wants to ask you something. Um, okay. We've had one of our alums is Corey Stoll. I don't know if you know Corey was there a little mm -hmm. ahead of you in school, but Corey's done a lot of film and theater work. And the last time he was here talking, he talked about wanting to go back to theater but once you kind of get in the film tv scheduling it's very hard to do so one of my questions is do you get to go back to theater do you want to or how does that work and where you are in your career right now ah uh, the machine um you know i call i got this from a book they call the industry like the machine and once you're in the machine it's it's hard to schedule around the machine yeah um, it dip I think it really depends on where you are. LA is not a place that no. has a, yeah, they're not, they don't so much value the theater. If you were in New York, you know, you're kind of in a different showcase, mm -hmm. but I would just say once you get on a show or you decide that acting is something you want to pursue, just always know that that's your focus. It doesn't mean that it has to be the only thing you do. And it doesn't mean that, uh, if you're doing it, you can't do other things, but for now, that's my focus, is what I'll say about that. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have time for them six week rehearsals. Four right, hours exactly. Night. I exactly. gotta be, at, I, my call time is usually 6 a.m., 6.30, sometimes if they're calling me late, so. And how many days of a week would you normally go in? Or how long does it take to do one episode for you know the whole process? It takes us eight business days. I'm super fortunate because I'm not one of the folks in the in the main kind mm -hmm. of um, bullpen. So I'm really only there like 
three, four days a week, two, three, depending on the script. But that's still, you know, I still got to have time to live. It's an uh, hour each way to get there. Oh, mm -hmm. Hello, um, LA. <laughs> hello, yes, LA. Uh, if you go, if you move to LA, I'd advise you si sign up, save up for a car. Save up for a car. And then save up for some rent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, well, I wanted to ask you also, um, Okay, so COVID. So you guys went back to shooting in the pandemic. And, um, um, you know, I've been watching how every single show and franchise handles it differently. I don't know what happened on NCIS Los Angeles. They look like they started shooting on video. I don't know what they were doing, but it looked like not like their show at all. Your show looks like your show pretty much. And um, so I noticed some people building masks into the scripts, other people don't. Sometimes you can see they're limiting how many people are in the frame. I, so what were some of the things that, uh, that um, your show did to adjust and to be able to get back to shooting? We, um, in terms of framing, they actually really didn't change much. Um, I, I, we do have, uh, you know, masks and COVID officers on set. We do get mm -hmm. tested like three times a week. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I personally just, just don't go anywhere other than work. <laughs> right. So they, they did, they did a good job of making sure that we stayed safe. I don't think we had any outbreaks really on set. When did you go back to shooting? Last, um, August. Oh, August. So, yeah. yeah. Well, that's great. Um, I guess last question that I would ask is, um, what do you like the most about this job and what kind of a part, if you could give yourself any part, would you want to play next? Oh, I, I like, I like um, the uh, regularity of it. That's a very rare thing. We don't, we just don't get that a lot in this, in this business. So I'm very grateful to have it. It's also just a really nice place to be. Everybody's really nice. Oh, that's good to hear. And I'll tell you a story. My sister came, this was pre-COVID because now we don't have visitors, but my sister came to visit the set. Um, and I hadn't had any family there. I think it was my second season. And Mark and then Mark Harmon heard that my sister was there and we were on set. I was coming to TikTok with her. <laughs> she was dancing. We turned around. Mark Harmon is just staring at us in the doorway. It's like, hi. Very embarrassing, but he insisted on sitting with my sister at lunch and then cleaned her trash up when it was time to go back to shooting. Uh, and the ADs are like, uh, Mr. Harmer, we're ready for you. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nicest, one of the nicest people I've ever met. So I always tell people, I'm like, listen, if he has that time to be so nice and so considerate, everybody really has the time mm -hmm. to be like very well. kind. Yes, and if you guys don't know who Mark Harmon is, if you don't know the NCIS franchise, which is now three shows, four shows, I don't know. It's it's a big, big franchise. One of the most big money makers, long lasting of television, and he has a big instrumental role in the whole thing. So, um, so what if it's you on tomorrow ready? night? Huh? It's on tomorrow night. If you've never seen it, thank you. And oh, by the yeah. way. Casey, I mean, Casey's been getting more story the last few times. I'm seeing mm -hmm. more. And mm -hmm. how, how does that happen? Does you just get <laughs> ripped and you have more or do you know it's going to happen? I, I do. I am there to service the story. So whatever they give me is what I'll do. But it's yeah. not just Mark, because all the, all the people that have been the number ones on our show, Ashley Tisdale, so nice, threw me a birthday party. Courtney oh. Cox, mm -hmm. such a gem, and did a pilot with her, answered all my questions. Let me hang out with her. Just yeah. wonderful people. Just be cool is what I'm saying. That is great. So last thing, what what's your dream role? Do you have a dream role or what if you could do something else next? Do you have any sense of what it would might what it might be? I don't know. I honestly I think a lot of people like the idea of being kind of like, you know, the head of the show. It's focused on them. I like being a supporting character. Um, because I like having a little bit more work life balance. Yeah, nice. That's nice. Okay, that's good to hear. Well, I'm going to open up and see if anyone else here would like to ask a question. If your face is on the screen, you can literally raise your hand. You don't have to use the raise hand function. I'm going to raise I, my hand. Go I'm, with that, I'm, right? I'm going to, I, I just have a, a couple of questions that I want to make sure um, uh, that get asked. So, Deanna, you talk about you, you talk about the reel, um, and obviously mm -hmm. now you have a very wonderful reel because you've had lots of great opportunities and made the most of them. When you first started out, what was that reel like and what was it composed of? When I first started out, my reel was, you know, mainly stuff that I had shot with my friends. 
just, uh, I mean, I think, I don't even think it was one minute long. Just, we tried to make, you know, like a little sketch that we thought was funny. I was performing at Second City at the time. <laughs> yeah. So some of, some of my Second City friends, we just like would make, you know, we would just be each other's cameramen, each other's um, camera people, each other's, you know, sound person. And everybody would just kind of switch off and we just make dumb little shorts. You know what I mean? And that's pretty much what my reel was exclusively. Yeah. And did you, did you have, um, because I knew that you had done work at Second City, did you have any kind of uh, other, I'm thinking about some of your classmates, because man, there are some oh. really amazing people. Yeah. You know, <laughs> up, I, went, you know I was year. on a, well, was was gonna say, wait, Deanna was going to say, well, who were you with? I was going to say, I was on a team with Avery for a long time. Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. Say like, Avery's last name, Matt, so everybody knows, or Deanna. Avery Munson, who Avery is Munson. Uh, now like a fantastic, fantastic uh, author of children's literature, actually, mm -hmm. um, but amazing. He, he wrote the book, I, some of our uh, students probably had this book when they were, you know, kids. Um, he wrote, he or, or co-authored uh, the book, All My Friends Are Dead, Oh. which is, you know, the little dinosaur. But now he has a new one out that just came out this year. Um, it's called the, I can't remember, The Longest Dog in the World. Uh, I Am the Longest Dog, yeah. I Am the Longest Dog, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So sweet. But um, yeah, so there were a, a, a number of people um, from your time um, did do a lot of uh, producing of their own stuff, like, just like really like like web series and stuff. Sarah Violet did, mm -hmm. um, um, uh, Ben Sinclair did, that's how High Maintenance got started. Yes, yeah. so I, I was trying to think of the name of Sarah Violet's short that Search Party was based on and I can't remember it, um, but yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and these were all just, these were self-produced things. I mean, I think, that, I think the world has changed a little bit since then, but even so, um, so many of our successful students um, have just made their own stuff and and somehow managed, you know, to to get seen that way. So I just think it's an important thing to mm -hmm. to think about. Yeah. I, yes, that's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Anything you can do, you know, absolutely do. And that's a really great point. Mm -hmm. High maintenance started off as a web series, and it became an HBO show. Yeah. So. <laughs> Having a point of view, being willing to put yourself out there, it can lead to really great things. Yep. By the way, if you haven't seen High Maintenance about the weed uh, man delivery <laughs> weed on his bike, please make sure you go find it. Yeah, um, sadly, it didn't get renewed for another season. And yet House Party came back it. for some reason. It went away and another network seemed to have picked it up. So how, wait, so, Search Party, sorry, I said House Party. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, party. <laughs> slightly different <laughs> slightly different yeah, yeah a little different yeah yeah um anyway. would anybody else like to ask a question of diana i'm gonna call cyril cyril would you like to ask a question because cyril is always like so creative so many ideas speaking of doing your own thing that is cyril so i'm just giving you space uh, yeah um i've just been listening and like what do we Taking notes, so thank you. Um, yeah. I guess if I think of a question on the top of my head, I think like even in me trying to do some like open college or this and that, there's a whole lot of like rejection in the in the space. And I think like knowing that this is what you want to do, but also like mediating that this might not be the time or the place to do it. I just how do you keep yourself going in the midst of like mm. the pandemic and the rejection and whatever mm. might like block that that path you know how do you push through that yeah that's a great question um nobody gets everything like even it doesn't matter who you are um it just is impossible even scheduling wise to get like literally everything you audition for uh i will recommend first off therapy for anybody therapy Hello. is great if you have any ability to get therapy, especially if the college has it as a resource, mm -hmm. please feel free to use it. It's really good. And then just also knowing that um, sometimes it's a blessing when you don't get things. I will tell a story. There was a show that I wanted so badly. It's called Detroiters. It was on um, uh, Comedy Central. 
and I am from Detroit, born and bred. Uh, it was, yeah, it was with some friends of mine that I knew they were doing it. I know Sam Richardson, and I was just like, I want this show so badly. I can't, I can't tell you how much I want this show. And I auditioned for it, and I <laughs> did it, and I did not get it. I mean, I and I had my, you know, my agents call. I was like, can you just check and see? Uh, and then fast forward to they shot the pilot. And for whatever reason, the part I auditioned for, the network like was wanted to change the actress out. So they had me audition for it again. And I, I mean, I did everything short of like begging for it. I didn't actually ask, but I was like praying for it. I was having my mom, I was like, send out to your prayer circle that I get this part. And I just didn't get it. And it ended up working out because in the time that it took, because there was so much downtime between those seasons, one, I would have had to leave LA to do it because we didn't shoot here. But because I was here, I got to shoot three series, mm. um, including writing on one of them mm. because I didn't get Detroiters and one of them being NCIS. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but you know, at this point, Detroiters has ended and I'm still on this show that I got to do because I am here. So sometimes, you know, Sometimes it takes a long time and some, and that's okay. It's just like, it's your journey. And the nice thing about acting is there's never really an age or a time when you have to stop. I think a lot of people feel like if I don't have something by the time I'm you know, this age or whatever, I need to settle down. No, you don't. <laughs> you really don't. Keep putting yourself out there, truly. Did I hear you say you were writing on one of the, the series you worked on? So has writing been part of your career now too? Yes. So I am an actor and a writer. This is part of the like, just be willing to do things because yeah. I did not think I was a writer uh, until I was trying to do this show, uh, a showcase. And they were like, you're not a very good actor, but we'll take you as a writer. And I was like, but I can't write. Um, but it got me started writing. And now I've written on three series. I wrote on um, a show called I Love Dick. Sorry. Um, I wrote on a show called um, Adam Ruins Everything on True TV. I wrote for the 2017 Independent Spirit Awards. I wrote for the MTV Awards. I wrote on a oh. show called I Love You America with Sarah Silverman. Oh. So it's I'm developing an, an, uh, an animated show with CBS right now that probably won't go anywhere, but still it's a paycheck. Um, just be willing, to, you know, everybody has a voice. And if it's something you're interested in, if it's directing, just give it a shot. Wow. Somebody else. What big advice? For... If you're interested, give it a shot. What big yeah. advice? But that's, that's what it is. Hey, on our new website for Oberlin College for the theater department says, if you don't see it, make it. That's our now our motto. <laughs> Deanna, do it. Hey. Hi. Hi. Um, hi. I have a question because I'm a theater major and I'm in a show right now that is being filmed. That was a play that is now adapted to film. And so I guess I'm just wondering what advice you would have to offer for like theater actors making that transition to film and like are interested in like taking that step away from theater or like what advice do you have like as an actor oh great um can i ask a clarifying question is the the film is it um like are you filming a live production or is it a film as in like more like a traditional film yeah it's like more like a traditional film like there, there's like multi-camera scenes and also oh, cool. like some other shots that are kind of like single camera it's a mix it's a hodgepodge so, Deanna this is how we made the COVID adjustment this is Paul Moser directing a play which was originally going to be done for stage and so we've taken all of our um, productions this year and the first one Chris directed um, Misanthrope as a um, audio play I said the right name didn't I and uh, name of play and so Chris did an audio play and then our other um, visiting professor just did fires in the mirror which was also shot one character at a time with green screen and then mm -hmm. this one Paul oh, wow. had a whole complete set built because he wanted to capture as much of the feeling of it being a, a, a play as well so um, so that's oh. what's happening now that's being shot so um, that's great yeah so now, um, yeah, so now you can respond. <laughs> well, no, that's great. And also we were just talking about reels. Great piece for your reel. Mm. I think um, one thing uh, to keep in mind that I had to remember when I was transitioning from theater to, um, to TV uh, is, and, and, film to, and film is even like theater to, to TV is one transition. And then 
going from TV to film is a whole nother transition. Um, it's even more important to listen and talk directly to the person who's in front of you. Uh, it's a lot smaller because mm -hmm. you can literally, you know, people's TVs are 85 inch. So you don't have to project, you know, all the way past the 12th row. Um, the same connection that you feel in theater, it's still there. It's just more intimate. So if you haven't, if you don't already do this, a lot of people have, this is the tool that you, which is your iPhone or your camera, um, your phone camera that you would use to film your, uh, your Zoom auditions. I would start getting a reader and um, have the reader get some sides from online, like Google TV shows that you like, look up scripts or movies that you like, uh, and have the person stand like almost directly behind the camera and mm -hmm. read the scene with them, looking at that person and mm -hmm. watch your performance back and see what you see. Wow. Um, because if it looks like a theater show that, that is too big, you can start to adjust yourself down um, mm -hmm. without, you know, needing to pay for classes, but just start to hone that like sense of just talking to someone who's just beyond the camera. Well, that is such good advice. Diba, did you want to say anything else? Yeah, actually, like hearing you say that, I had a question about the real like, in a situation yeah. like that, because it is a play and is written as a play. Would you suggest that I use like a bit of a uh, dialogue or a space where it is more of like my own monologues? I know earlier you said like Floyd monologues. So, oh, oh. Um, hmm. I think, uh, gosh, this is tough. I would, I would say, first off, use whichever piece is stronger. Um, like you always want to lead off on the strongest foot and any rule I give you, there's someone else in LA that can be like, but I've broken that rule and look how well it worked out for me. So you don't have to take anything as like, you know, word of God. Um, but the reason I said avoid monologues is there are services that basically what they do is they say, oh, you need a reel? What you want? We got you. And then they film what is uh, very obviously a one person staged scene where it'll be an actor um, looking at the, looking just past the camera and being like, you think you know me? You don't know me. And then they'll go on for like this two minute monologue and it looks very weird. And so that's what I'm trying to get y'all away from. Um, yep. But if it honestly looks like a good, if it's just a good piece and it happens to be a monologue, absolutely fine. But it, there's that weird static, there's this weird static -y thing that, um, that happens sometimes with monologues that you know are out of context. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. hmm. Anybody else like to ask a question? Yeah, yeah I, have, I have a couple of questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah, um, so you mentioned that you're writing now. Are you thinking eventually of producing or becoming a director? Uh, well, it's a slightly complicated question only because as you move up, you know, there's, um, I'm in the Writers Guild, which is basically the union for writers. And as you move up that kind of chain and you get higher and higher writing positions, producer is just a level. So if I continue writing, I probably just will be a producer. But uh, I think the idea of like just solely producing if I wasn't acting in something or writing it, probably not. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as far as directing goes, um, maybe, you know, I was thinking about Caroline actually, um, because one of my co-stars in NCIS is Rocky Carroll. I know. Of, <laughs> yep. Yep. And you did a lot of work with August Wilson. Three degrees of separation. I knew Rocky when he was starting out. In, I thought you did. Yeah. Uh, I thought you, you did. You may or may not remember. All you have to do is say Afro-American Cultural Center at Yale and everybody says, oh, that lady. That lady. <laughs> I will. I will. I know I'll bring it up to him. But um, Rocky is an excellent director. He's a really wonderful Aww. director. And he really brings all of those acting skills. You know, he's the director who asks you, you know, like, what, what, what are you thinking for this scene? Mm. Um, but right now, it's, it's, it's a lot to just be a writer and to be a Black woman, honestly, um, oh. and an actor. 
that adding directing onto it when it's not necessarily my calling or something that I have a lot of experience in is probably something that I'm not looking to do at this exact moment. This is another LA thing. I never say I can't do something. That's I'm just right. like, well, maybe not right now. <laughs> well, you know what's so interesting when you mentioned Rocky, it's amazing to see how many actors from television shows transition to directing. Mm -hmm. um, so who knows? Matt, were you gonna say something else? Oh, um, Celine, did you wanna ask a question? I have to put my glasses on to see who anybody is. <laughs> oh, sorry. Good time. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, so I'm actually not a theater major here. Um, then that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm in my fifth year and I'm a double degree in biology and jazz voice. Um, oh, hi. Hey. Yeah. That's and wonderful. I decided to go into a career in, in the performing arts. So I want to go into music and acting. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the things that I would like to do is apply to grad school for acting, but I haven't had any like formal classes. I've only done workshops and things. Um, so uh, I guess one of my questions for you is like, have you met very many peers like when you went to grad school that hadn't done any, like hadn't had a BA or uh, BA in like theater before? Um, have like I don't know I that's just one thing that really scares me is the fact that I haven't like uh done very much of that in my time here uh yeah <laughs> if if you look at people actors um kind of biographies before they started acting people come from all walks truly um the woman who I took over from uh the role Polly Perrette she studied oh. science um, she studied forensic science, actually. Oh. People are like, did you study science too? I'm like, no, girl. <laughs> um, absolutely not. Um, people come, Mark Harmon was a football player before he came. Grad school, a lot of people did come from a BFA, but it's, I think it depends on the school. I think it just depends on what the requirements are. But people come, you can come to acting at any time, um, at any place, really, truly. That's, Blaine, but I, talk to I, Matt. I, I, yeah. Okay. I was just going to say, talk to Matt. That's what I was yeah. to Matt. So, Celine, Celine, send me an email and we'll set up a time because I'm happy to talk about that. I am, I'm well versed in <laughs> how to get people into grad school. <laughs> so. yeah. Matt is actually, he is, that is one of the things he's doing so well for students. And so Celine, because you go to Oberlin College, you should feel free to talk to any of us. You know, we're all here. And just so you know, Deanna, Celine's teacher is this dynamic African-American woman named Latanya Hall. We finally have an actual jazz voice teacher who also started an official gospel choir for the college. So oh, great. there's something that makes us pretty happy. Would somebody else like to ask Deanna can, anything? Can I say one more thing? Oh, of course you can. Uh, <laughs> Matt gave oh, Matt gave me a really good piece of advice when I was auditioning for grad school, which is I still remember this. He was like, make sure that they have that you have multiple monologues prepared, even if it says it's only two. Because when you audition for UCSD, was it twelve or nine they made you do? Eleven. It was it was it was somewhere between seven and twelve. <laughs> yeah. Like, I kind of I kind of blacked out after the sixth one and they kept asking. So it was like a huge number. Yeah. Yeah. And it <laughs> happened and it happened to me too. It oh. happened to me where they were like, they were like, more, more, more. And I was like, at that point, at the, some point, I was just, I should have known I was a writer because I was making stuff up. I was like, what is this wall in front of me? <laughs> um, but yeah, it was truly because I did my little five monologues that I had prepared and they were like, more. Yep. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. Celine, that's why you need to go talk to Matt because that's, <laughs> and, yeah, I just told another student the other day. I always tell that story, that story, just like we all remember that story. But it is really true that not only should you have a lot of monologues, they should really showcase the different sides of you and your different talents and abilities. And so people really, as somebody who has gone and done casting, you know, in professional shows with professional casting agents, what you want the most is for people to know the versatility. Um, mm -hmm. You want them to know you just not cannot just do one thing. So mm -hmm. that's my two cents. I and just have one one more question. Go ahead, Celine. Yeah. Um, so one thing I uh, have heard a lot when it comes to music is that um, a lot of people say like 
don't get an agent until you need an agent. Like book your own gigs, do your own things until you get to a point where doing that work is cutting into the time that you would actually be using to like perform or work or practice. Um, huh. How is that with acting? Is it better to just get an agent like right out the bat? Like, uh, like you were saying, or, or, or like you were talking about um, after like a showcase or yeah. how, how um, no. that? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, I don't see any reason to not have an agent as soon as you have an agent. If you like the agent, they don't cost money and they should not be making any money unless you are making money. They just make a percentage. If you meet somebody that's trying to be like, well, you got to go, but I need you to have this headshot. I need you to go this specific photographer. I need you to do. No, um, I, I don't see why it would hurt is what I is. I can't see a downside to having an agent early. If you can't go up, I will say, okay, here's one downside. If you are working a job and you need to save up and no shame in that, um, and you just know you can audition for like three years, it might not make sense to have an agent because um, you don't want to just be sitting on somebody's roster and constantly turning down auditions. Yeah. That's not a great thing. You might just want to go back to that agent and say, um, thank you so much for your interest. I'm not available right now, but I'd love to contact you in the future. Mm -hmm. But that's the only that's the only time I can see a downside. Mm -hmm. And I had to do that at one point. I had to just kind of like take myself off of someone's roster because I was like, Mama needs some money. You know, mama has to work. And I was working a full time job and I couldn't audition. So mm -hmm. that's what that was. That's real. Makes yeah. sense. Thank you so much uh for all of your wise words today. <laughs> was... Yeah, no worries. Anybody Sorry, else? I didn't mean to cut you off, but yeah, no worries. <laughs> Anybody else? Deanna, Alex Howell could possibly email you just a couple other questions for our newsletter next month. Um, if if it's okay for him to use your email that Matt has or some other Absolutely. way of contacting you. But that's Alex. Alex, do you want to put your face on and say hello? Or maybe you don't, because sometimes there's a reason why you don't want to. <laughs> I know that's true for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just at work, which is why I have my camera off. Um, okay. in, uh, in Warner. Um, oh, he's actually in Warner Center in the booth, Deanna. That's what oh, I know Warner. Oh, I miss Warner. You know, my cat's named Warner. Um, yeah. Now um, a lot of our acting classes are not in Warner because our new building also and our renovation of Hall Annex gave us some acting studios on that side of town. I'm still teaching over there. We still got a few things going on over there. But yes, Alex is <laughs> sitting in the booth. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. I saw Cyril had his hand raised by the way for a sec. Not to put you on the spot, but if you have a question, go on ahead. Yeah, it was just a quick one. I was um, just been listening to the, the amount of different talents you have. And I'm wondering how you bring those together, like in a specific spot, because like I have like a bunch of different interests. And one thing I'm always concerned about is like, how do I like say I book this role here or say I get uh -huh. this commission to do this? How do I make it all work in the same frame? Like. Could you tell me just a little bit about that? Great question. Just like I talked about work-life balance before, where I was like, sometimes I had to take myself out of the acting pool because I had to work. Um, I tend to do one thing at a time. I know there's some artists like um, Mindy Kaling or like uh, Tyler Perry or Amanda Beers who kind of do our multi-hyphenates in that exact moment where they're like, I'm in this thing that I wrote or I'm directing this thing that I'm also acting in. That's not how I work. So it'll just kind of really be whatever is, is best for you. I guess the more universal advice that I'd give is, um, someone told me once that nothing blooms year round, that every, every flower and fauna just needs some rest at some point. Mm -hmm. So just because you're not doing something at one moment doesn't mean you'll never do it. Um, and you might just need to like, focus on a thing. You know, that is one of the best things I've ever heard. And I'm going to take that right to my heart today. <laughs> I think we're probably going to let Deanna go. Matt, anything you can think of? Only to say that we love you. We and love it's, you. Uh, oh, wait, so I forgot to tell Deanna. You. I was cleaning out my closet and I found your certificate from <laughs> Africana Studies. You actually won an award that you never I did? Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to send it to you. 
it's so okay. random that I knew we were, you know, trying to get you to do this. And I'm like, I opened this box of who knows what. <laughs> and I'm like, look, it's Deanna. <laughs> What a so, good day. I, I shall send you your Wednesday. certificate of award from Africa, which was then African-American studies, but Africana studies as we say now. So I will take that. Thank you very much. And also I do miss, and I love everybody. And I really do mean it when I say I did learn so much uh, from being at Oberlin, from Caroline, from Chris, from Matt, from everybody. And I just, I have all these really funny moments that I always remember and I take with me, like the professionalism that I learned there. Um, I really do take with me to every job. That's bad. Well, thank you. And you, I think I revealed to everyone that I'm obsessed with television. <laughs> 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 yeah. One of our former students who's a poet, a really, really well-known poet came to my class and introduced us to something called ekphrastic writing. Okay, you know what that is? She was watching TV and writing to the people on TV. And I'm like, my talent of watching TV all the time is gonna pay off. So it paid off when I saw you on NCIS. So anyway, as everyone said, tomorrow night, it's a new episode, I think, of NCIS tomorrow night. So yeah, I just, I just want to give Diana's Oberlin career a little bit of a shout out because um, some of my my most fun memories are from roles that she did, especially in one play, Deanna, oh you have gosh. to remember Anton oh, yeah. and the show business. I loved it. Play in which, in which Deanna played like four or five different characters, mm -hmm. and they were all so beautifully distinct and absolute people, and some of the funniest stage work I've ever seen. And it still lives here and here as um, a great example of, of student work that is is just exceptional and every, anyone can do this and anyone at Oberlin who's working in the theater and taking on roles don't be afraid because Diana did many different things and That's did right. them well and I could yeah. list just a, you know many many more and uh, roles but that particular play especially that producer guy oh my god oh my gosh really fun, uh, really fun. you all you are so sweet to bring that up, but also like it was every great. every teacher I had there pushed me. Like every professor that I had pushed me to do something, even when I um, didn't think I can. So when they push you, <laughs> when they're like, "I know you can do more with this," believe them because they know they know. Wow, we are just so fortunate to have you with us today. And Matt was the person whose brainstorm it was to have the roundtable. And Matt, what's our last roundtable going to be about? for the year? Uh, coming up in May, we're going to have um, some guests from the Cleveland Theater area um, who founded uh, or, or drafted the original um, uh, Cleveland uh, Clean House um, document, which is basically a document about uh, um, a variety of things, but basically safety in theater spaces um, around issues of identity. Um, you know, the the issues that are particularly important to women, people of color, queer people. Um, one of the, the the very first person who actually sort of organized it was the artistic director of Obama Theater, along with a much loved actress in Cleveland, uh, Nina Domingue who um, worked really tirelessly. And I was fortunate enough to have been included in that. So uh, they're gonna come and they're gonna talk about the state of things now. We kind of started with the year with that and we're, we want to uh, wrap up this year of roundtables with those considerations, so. We're also excited to say that we're gonna be joined on the faculty next year by Kari Barclay, who will be teaching theater history, but also intimacy, directing and choreography queer and trans performance and some new things that we haven't had. So that's kind of a build on what the clean house movement has been about too. Well, thanks everybody for being here with us, Tiana. Okay, I can't wait this long to talk to you again. So I'm gonna get your info from Matt so I can just oh, hit yeah. you up and say hi. All right, everybody. Well, see you in May and make sure you see Twilight Bowl featuring uh, D-Way among other students, yeah. so Ooh. yay. All right.
Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.